Okay, thank you very much for that nice introduction and hello everyone. Um, so let me just tell you a little about what's happening uh, regarding data science in the NIH, but I'll try and cast it in perhaps a broader context because I understand not all of you are, are biomedical um, as we go through. But I think uh, on the next slide what you can see is that a driver, I'm just sort of describing where we've come from and, and why there's this interest at least in biomedicine uh, with big data. So what uh, th there is at the NIH uh, an organization called the National Center of Biotechnology Information which actually provides access to all of the literature, uh, most of the bi biomedical literature plus um, a, a number of biological databases. Uh, this is someone gave me recently is a CD-ROM which was the complete collection of NCBI uh, which is used by millions of people every day. Uh, back in 1993. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you could just get a sense of where we are today. Uh, they now have 20 petabytes of active storage that uh, is used uh, regularly across all of biomedicine. And someone made a calculation that that represents about 400 million four-drawer filing cabinets. Um, so clearly, you know, uh, it's just really to emphasize in our discipline uh, that we're we've exhibited and seen enormous amounts of digital data uh, and knowledge for that matter by virtue of the literature that have appeared in the last uh, you know 20 years or so but you know the question is where are we in that process and uh, where are we going and I think it's very hard uh, to judge that uh, at the NIH there are actually 27 institutes and centers geared towards specific diseases uh, looking at specific organs and so on. And when I asked the directors of all those institutes uh, where we're going, they they sort of throw up their hands that I think it's very hard to predict. Uh, I actually quite like this book on the next slide there, on slide four, which uh, describes uh, the second machine age, which is essentially that we're effectively in this new industrial revolution. And we're at the, the sort of hockey stick uh, inflection point of where we're going to go with this and the evidence that these folks, these authors uh, come up with uh, is the idea, is the, re the reasoning that they say this is because the, uh, the evidence is that a number of things which we actually thought would take much longer are, are actually here. Uh, Self-driving cars where obviously there's uh, real-time processing of large amounts of sensor data um, to successfully steer a vehicle, that's here already even though people thought that would take longer. So, and you can go down this, this list um, of, of examples, which really are sort of ahead of schedule. So this is, uh, this is sort of the motivation for the way we think about data uh, at the NIH and what's happening and how it's going to impact uh, biomedical research and indeed healthcare. Um, one of the aspects of this, that, of course, that's quite worrying is on the next slide, and so it's a, a challenge. I uh, probably don't need to tell you that uh, funding budgets are flat at best. Um, the top left of that graph is really uh, the NIH budget. Well, even though it's $30 billion a year, it's effectively flat. And uh, in inflation adjusted dollars is actually declining. At the same time, on the bottom right, and this is just taken from a, 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 a characterization of bio, a biomedical databases, and you can see that this is growing at a, a very fast rate. So the bottom line is what we're doing doesn't scale. And we need to have uh, new thoughts and new processes for what this means. So our approach to this is really to try and foster the development of an ecosystem um, that builds, that enables biomedical research as it's broadly interpreted. Uh, and we see this as a sort of digital enterprise. And... Uh, the part in italics is really just taken from the NIH mission statement itself. So really what we're doing is sort of uh, ex expanding on, uh, extending on that uh, initial mission um, with the advent of uh, the digital uh, possibilities that exist. So how, do we, how are we sort of taking advantage of that? And if you're in this business or even thinking of getting in this business, uh, what, what can it mean to you? What are the opportunities? Um, and that's sort of something I'm going to describe uh, in sort of general terms. So in the next slide, uh, we've, we've, and I guess it's a theme of your meeting, 
Uh, we've actually created a big data to knowledge initiative. Uh, we just a couple of weeks ago funded the, the first round uh, of centers, and I'll say a little more about that in a second. Uh, but we put $32 million into this, and this is a, an ongoing program that's going to go at least until the end of the decade. Uh, and at least earmarked for this, uh, subject to available funds, this is over $600 million uh, worth of investment in really, uh, you know, I think changing the way we think and we do biomedical research as it becomes far more analytical uh, than it has been before. And we're approaching this in three ways. Uh, and I th I'd say there's elements of the ecosystem, and I think they all need to work in lockstep. I mean, nothing's going to happen unless the community, which is on slide eight here, uh, is uh, behind all of this. So the Venn diagram just sort of really in a simplistic way describes uh, the three components. I'm going to say a little more about each of them. Um, so clearly all of this has to come from the community. If the community doesn't drive this from the bottom up, then there's just no point in, in trying to do these things. Uh, but clearly that that's happening um, and there are a number of vibrant organizations that have sort of sprung up to uh, to sort of work in this space. One of them is, a, is something called the, the Global Alliance for Genomic Health, which is a very vibrant organization now uh, of a number of, uh, of, organiza of fellow uh, uh, comprising a number of organizations and many people. And then the top down is really what we do either at the federal government level or uh, the NIH level within the federal government with regard to policy and process. Uh, and then the other part is the infrastructure to support it. And then sitting in all of this is the need to sustain it, um, to support collaboration and, of course, training. Uh, training is critical to all of this. It's been identified as uh, an area where we really need to do more because the, right now, the supply is right, way out of whack with the demand for uh, for jobs in, in data science, in, not just in biomedicine, but everywhere. Uh, when I left San Diego uh, about six, seven months ago to take this job, I was uh, the Associate Vice Chancellor of Innovation, and we had a, a big data meeting just before I left, not dissimilar to the one you're having today. And um, I, I have to say it was extremely well attended. and. Uh, uh, the the folks you know the private sector folks said uh, there that there were at that time there were four and a half thousand data science related jobs in uh, biomedicine in San Diego that could not be filled and at that time our UCSD was not even didn't even have a data science major so clearly these things need to be addressed but none of this stuff is going to happen without in the next slide um, uh, slide nine what we call the sort of virtuous research cycle so. You know, researchers are going to do uh, what is best for their research. And I think, uh, you know, the motivation is within that, and that's sort of shown on the next slide. So, uh, but, uh, and this sort of all came out of workshops we've had, and there's just a link there to a workshop, the most recent one, uh, for how, how this uh, sort of works. So the drivers are that... Uh, the researchers are motivated by their own research, but of course they have the need and they produce data and tools and results come from this. So it's really uh, that's sort of the seat on this kind of three-legged stool, if you like. So let me just say uh, a little about our thinking with respect to each of the, uh, the legs. And let's start of the stool. Let me start with policies. So in the NIH, we have data sharing policies, um, and they vary depending on the type of data. We've just introduced a more extensive genomic data sharing policy, uh, which, of course, is an effort to balance the need to make pub these data public, because they were generated with public money, versus protecting the, uh, the individual, uh, the privacy of the individual. So uh, there's quite extensive... Uh, policies that have been uh, developed to support this. Um, we're extending what we do with data sharing plans. Um, NSF, for example, uh, has data sharing plans on all of their awards. We currently only have them on larger awards, but that's changing. But in any case, I don't think any of us really, uh, and enforce is not a good word, but really uh, encourage the, uh, the, the use of uh, data sharing, uh, whatever one says in a data sharing plan. And I think we're implementing ways, first of all, by making the data sharing plan itself, 
but you write with a grant, uh, machine readable so it can be passed and uh, checked to see if, in fact, uh, data has been made available. So uh, these are examples of data sharing policies. I think another aspect of this which is forthcoming is the idea that uh, I think, which is to me critical in all of this, which is the idea that um, what it means to be a scholar is actually changing. And uh, I think it's wrong for us to measure uh, people just, uh, as they say, in the biomedical space to by their output uh, in one word journals, namely science, nature and cell. Um, there's much more to being a scholar. Uh, there always has been, but it's even more pronounced in this era. So, for example, one should be rewarded for producing well-formed and reusable data sets that enable others to, to do science. And so I think we, we need to put more emphasis on the value of data. And data citation is one way of doing that. So I think you're going to see that very shortly that we will uh, really support the notion of data citation as a valid uh, form of citation, just as a paper cite is cited. And we'll see that on... Uh, grant submissions, um, reports, uh, bibliographic sketches and the like. And clearly this is in keeping with the emergence of data journals and so forth. So that's the, what I want to say. There's a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll be brief because it would be better if you have questions if we had a bit of a chat about some of these things. Um, just to be say briefly about the infrastructure, we're in the process of setting up the notion of a commons uh, which is, as you, in the sort of simplest sense, is pretty much like a commons in a village. Uh, it's a shared space that no one really owns, that people come and use. Um, and in our case, it's going to support, it says data there, but it's really about supporting uh, all research objects, software, data, narrative, and so forth, in a, a shared environment. Uh, and we're standing this up in conjunction with the awards we've just made. So it's really a collection of, uh, physically, it's a collection of compute and storage resources, um, both in public and private clouds and in institutions and so on. And what makes it, what defines it, are uh, essentially an agreement that those providers uh, apply to. Uh, so there's a sort of commons compliance. And it's not, that doesn't really mean very much, and it'll mean very little in the beginning. Um, we just, the meeting we had earlier this week, uh, to discuss a lot of this stuff with the PIs of the awards we've just made, had present the major cloud providers, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. And this is now beginning to be set up. So just to give you an example, I'll give you uh, one example of what this could look like. In other words, it could actually look like uh, effectively what a Dropbox looks like. It could be an icon on your desktop. But as you drag and drop file types into this, um, we can do more than we uh, is typically done with a, a resource like Dropbox, which is namely not just define the sharing and the provenance associated with that data, but also validate it against standards that have been defined by the community at the point that it's dragged and dropped. That would, for example, then generate some metadata that describes how compliant it is to a community standard, which is available to uh, certainly the people who own the data, but also the people that they share it with. Um, and so, you know, one level it's sort of a storage of, uh, with a measure of quality on that data. Um, we're not doing this in a big way. We're just going to run some experiments to see how this, uh, if and how this starts to take off. So it's a really quite agile approach. So just on the next slide with a US map on it, um, these are the, the various centers that we funded. We funded a series of centers and those centers 12 centers, and those centers have a series of collaborators. Uh, and I'll notice that there's, uh, from the Braxter, there's quite a, an, an omission there. So certainly uh, going forward, I think uh, having your engagement in this would be uh, highly desirable. Um, and so these are all uh, folks who have, at, at some level, these awards, and they're all working. And the, there's a, a consortium that's uh, now begun so that we begin to develop this ecosystem. So while they're doing uh, specific research within their own centers across a, a large variety of data types, ranging from um, molecular data, genomic data, all the way through to patient cohorts, uh, and in fact, uh, data that relates to e-health so, uh, and mobility, so collecting large streams of data for mobile devices and so forth, all of that's embraced within these, these centers. And they will be developing um, 
tools, standards, uh, reference data sets and so forth, which will become part of this ecosystem and be shared uh, by, ev to, by everybody who's interested. So that's sort of uh, how it looks like. In the next slide, um, uh, I won't, well, I won't go into the governance of it, uh, but that, we had that meeting already and it was, I would say, very successful. Um, so just to sort of describe some short-term interactions that are going on, uh, to give you a flavour, if you're directly involved in this area, you might want to think about uh, attending these workshops. If not, uh, it really gives you a flavour of the kinds of ways we're thinking, at least within one federal agency, uh, which I hope you find useful. So first of all, uh, it's clear that, uh, you know, I have only been in the federal system for a few months, but it, it's sort of, it's so incredibly siloed, it's, it's quite depressing in many ways. So I think we've been reaching out to other agencies. So we have workshops set up now uh, with uh, the NSF. Uh, and uh, one of the things we're going to look at there is, is really the education of uh, university administrators about how scholarship is changing and how the funding agencies are thinking about that change and how we're hoping that institutions will respond to that change in how they do promotions and the like. Um, another one is really the notion of public-private partnership and we're uh, working with NOAA on uh, a workshop around this. So I think the, the sustainability aspect of what we do in the face of flat budgets really calls into uh, prominence the idea that we have uh, that we bring the private sector into these things. Uh, we're working, Elixir's a, a, a big network of biomedical uh, resources and people in Europe, and uh, we're working with them on some standards. One of the standards I find particularly interesting is the idea that and there's an emergent, you know, ever-increasing emergent set of courses online and physical uh, that relate to all sorts of things, of course, but including data science that really finding them and getting any sorts of measure of how the quality of them is really, um, you know, is, is very hard. So I think a first step is to have some standards for describing these things so they can be searched and looked up. And in other words, metadata that describes these courses. And that's not something that we should do in isolation. It's something we should do with other agencies in the U.S. and with our overseas partners. And that's going on. And then I'm very keen... Uh, on the idea of working with un uh, non-traditional communities, um, and in, at least from the NIH point of view. And so an example of that is the game developers have come to us. They want to get involved in biomedical research. We're having a workshop actually next month uh, uh, with them to, to look at what we might do. We've already had hackathons that related to HIV, uh, which have, was extremely successful in a series of very in entertaining and useful kinds of uh, educational games came out of that. Uh, and so we're looking to, for that kind of model. Uh, and then there's going to be workshops around sustainability. So I'm almost done. Um, the next slide really talks about uh, the training. We're setting up uh, a training center or, or at least um, uh, a place where training will be coordinated um, both online and physical around data science activities uh, that relate to the NIH because that's clearly missing right now. And we made a series of awards that already, and there'll be more this year, which relate to um, short-term training opportunities. So the idea that graduate students and postdocs can go and spend uh, time in data science-rich labs. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, and um, uh, you know, come back and bring that skill set back to the, their own laboratories. And then, of course, in three, there's the, the training uh, of uh, people in the discipline of uh, sort of biomedical data science itself. So we've, we've funded a series of awards that support that already, uh, and there'll be more. On the next slide, uh, just to say a little that there's, there's grants forthcoming. We're trying to uh, stimulate uh, grants I already mentioned of gamers, but also uh, more so with statisticians, computer scientists, uh, and data scientists in other fields which um, that can contribute things to the biomedical data science problems uh, as well as support for communities. So these are these awards, some of which will be, there'll, there'll be announcements pretty shortly about some of these. So here's just the final, and then the next slide, slide 20, uh, there's really um, a sort of 
uh, examples of what we're, we're, we're funding. We're also looking for ideas for things to fund. So, uh, you know, this is your chance to speak out. Um, so certainly the commons that I mentioned that we're setting up, uh, we're looking uh, for sort of uh, uses of the commons. We've got lots of ideas around that, but uh, we want to hear from the community. Uh, the, the idea of standards, of course, is important. Uh, there are frameworks that exist that sort of catalogue and describe standards already. We'd like to see uh, that continue and certainly build upon that for what we're, what we're interested. Software, analytical software to support the biomedical enterprise, not at all stages of its life cycle, both in um, prototyping new software approaches or new algorithms that are manifest in software, but also... Um, to you know, for hardening of existing software to so that it, it, it becomes uh, much more robust than it would otherwise be the case. Um, and I mentioned the community as part of it. And then uh, you know, relatively small amounts, but we're interested in some high risk, high return projects. I mean, I think one of the disappointing things that's happened uh, with uh, the fact that funding levels overall across agencies is so low right now. That it's made the system more conservative, and um, we're we're seeing not seeing the kinds of high risk uh, kinds of proposals that people believe they just wouldn't get funded. So we want to try and stimulate that as best we can. So that's pretty much it from me. Um, I didn't want to go on too long. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them, um, or uh, you know anything you want to say really. And I I put my email up here on the very last slide, and I encourage you to. Uh, uh, contact me if uh, if you have thoughts or ideas or questions. Thank you very much.